All right, well, you guys chose Java libraries you can't afford to miss. And uh, so let me get started immediately. Uh, I have a use case. I write an application that can consume a REST API. And uh, this application uh, right now will be written as a desktop app. And I know that not that many of you may use desktop applications, but the libraries we're going to see today, you can use them in any environment. You can use it on the desktop, on the web, server side, even mobile. Now, we want these components to be a small and reusable. And we also want to say no to boilerplate code because we have some frameworks that will say, well, if you follow the Poge approach, yeah, things are peachy, but you have to write a lot of things. And uh, we definitely would like our behavior to be testable. Without any further ado, these are the libraries that we're going to see today. They are, uh, hello. Uh, they are split between production and test. Now, I would expect that you are familiar with some of these libraries. And uh, let's see what about the uh, testing ones. So disclaimer, all the things that we're going to see today are open source. Uh, so you can use them as is immediately on your projects without any strings attached. My goal at the end of the session is hopefully that at least one of you will feel like this, trying out one of these libraries. So you guys let me know. My name is Andres Almirai. I come from Mexico, so that's why I'm wearing this pin. And I work for this company called Canu in Switzerland, in Basilea. And we do a lot of interesting things with Java and Groovy. I'm a member of the Groovy development team since uh, 2007, so that's, wow, nine years ago. And uh, I'm also a Java champion like these fellows right here, Kirk and Simone and Sebastian. And uh, I'm a founder also of this uh, community of people called the Hacker God. And what we do is that we come together at the end of a working day and spend the time for four or five hours, hack on open source projects, and at the end of the session, we push the contribution to the public. That's the whole point. It's like a hackathon, but you make something good for open source. Okay. If you feel that I'm speaking too fast, well, English is not my native language. So if I'm speaking too fast, please let me know. If also you have any questions at any time, please let me know. So let me remind you of the use case of the things that we're going to build today. And uh, for this, I chose the GitHub API. Why? Because it's very well known and it's very well documented. The URL is right there when you can find more information about the GitHub API per se. And I chose to just deal with query repositories because you can do a lot of things with the GitHub API. So when you query a repository, you can go to that particular URL and that describes everything that you have to do to send data and what is the kind of format and the output that you're going to get from that particular call. Basically, what we want to do is issue a GET request that follows that pattern. In terms, instead of organization, you, you supply the name of the whatever organization and then you get a JSON payload that looks like this one, but it's actually much, much bigger. That, if you recall, that's the, uh, an array of an object. That object's a repository. It contains like 40 different properties or more. We will only be taking care of a few of them. And uh, in the JSON world, you may be aware of this, in the JavaScript world, they like to use the snake case convention, so full underscore name and uh, HTML underscore URL, but in Java, we like to use camel case convention. So we will have to find a way to do that mapping within one convention to the other when going from JSON to Java. So let me show you the application working. Um, let's run it. Um, I tend to build all my, all my projects, or most of them, using uh, Gradle. So we zoom in into this app. Looks like this. There we go. So if I gave it a name of, uh, of a repository, actually an organization, and uh, notice what happens when this goes away. There's the nice things about JavaFX, bindings, and whatnot. So I start clicking this. And then that little uh, progress bar tells me that even though I'm issuing a network call in the background, the UI still resp responses of at any time I can cancel this and the application is working. One of the big problems with Java on the desktop is to build responsive APIs, uh, responsive applications, so that is that you do not block the, uh, the UI thread. So let's go back into the presentation. So what we need for this, uh, some sort of dependency injection mechanism, perhaps. 
And uh, we definitely need to have an HTTP client and have some REST abstraction on top of that. Uh, we need to uh, do JSON mapping, so uh, map the JSON payload into Java objects. We need a way to remove all the boilerplate code. And finally, because we're building a desktop application, we need to handle concurrency. There is a single rule when writing any kind of desktop applications, regardless of the toolkit of your choice, Swing, JFX, Azure, T, Pybot, Lanterna, doesn't matter. Everything that is UI must be done inside the UI thread. That is, reading properties from a widget, or writing properties from a widget, or painting a widget. Everything that is not UI, such as reading from a file, executing a database call, or is issuing a network call, must happen outside of the UI thread. All the code that you're going to see today is available at this URL. You're going to get the slides later, so don't worry. And uh, everything is open source. If you see a problem, please let me know, and that's how I can make the code better. OK, so now let's get started. In case of dependency injection, I would expect that most of you be already familiar with dependency injection. OK, so basically what we want to do is define a contract. So that's something that may look like this, and we want to inject an implementation of safe contract in some other component, such, for example, a controller. The application that you saw is split uh, or is implemented using the uh, MVC design pattern, so we will have a controller, a model, and a view. So here is the controller. Pretty much this is the whole controller. Uh, we will like to inject two objects, two collaborators, the model and the GitHub implementation of the API. We'll see that in just a moment. And uh, that's basically it, what we want to do. So for this, my first choice will be to use Google Juice because it is the reference implementation for JSR 330, which is the JSR that defines how we do injections in the Java platform. Now, Juice gives you a programmatic API for defining the bindings. The binding is how you define a source type and how you define that or map it into a target type. So here we have three different types of bindings from a sort type whose type is GitHub into a target type GitHub implementation, and we bind it into the singleton scope. That way that we only have a single instance for that particular target type. You can bind it to different scopes, for example, uh, session scope if you are on the web or application or your custom scopes. The second type, the second binding, both the source and the target type are exactly the same. And the third type is uh, how we create a lazy value using providers. If, you, you, if you're familiar with a Spring, this is the same thing as using factory bins. So the reason to use Juice is basically because it's the reference implementation. It's quite small, I would say, and it only gives you dependency injection. Its life cycle is extensible, and uh, there is one particular caveat when using Google Juice. If you're familiar with the at post construct annotation or the at pre destroy annotation from CDI, Juice does not support them out of the box. But there is an extension for Juice that will allow you to have these capabilities. And the software that you see in repositories uses that extension. As a bonus, when you choose to use Juice, you get Google Guava as well. The advantages of Google Guava are very well known if you are still tied to JDK 7. Is anybody here still using JDK 7 on production? Okay, so most of you are using JDK 8, which is good. So Google Guava gives you additional capabilities for collections, but also gives you functional capabilities. But because most of you are already in Java 8, then that shouldn't be much of a problem. If you're not using Juice and you want to use dependency injection, most likely you are familiar with the Spring Framework. And I'm talking right now just about Spring Core because the Spring portfolio contains a lot, and I mean a lot of projects. And the Spring Core Framework gives you not just dependency injection and also the capabilities to be compatible with JSR 330, but gives you uh, additional assertions and uh, message sources. I don't know if you know, but the message format from the JDK, the default ones, for example, simple date format, is not thread safe. It's, it causes a lot of trouble. And uh, well, a Spring Core gives you message format implementations that are actually thread safe. And it gives you additional capa uh, capabilities for serializing, accessing JDBC, 
and uh, creating JMX clients and servers with the Spring Court is so easy, it should not be allowed. And uh, some other things. Anyway, now let's get into reducing boilerplate code and at the same time trying to do the uh, JSON mapping. Uh, I know you guys know the um, Java Beans convention by heart. So when you want to define a property, what do we do? We create a private field, a getter, and a setter. And if it's a read-only property, it only contains a getter. And if it's a well-behaved POJO, it should have an equals and hash code implementation, a two-string that should follow certain rules. These rules are the ones laid out by Josh Block in Effective Java. So when you put everything together, you actually had to write a lot of code just for creating a simple, well-behaved POJO. Would it be in, will it, I know that you can tell your IDE to generate source code using uh, macro generators. The problem that I see with this approach is that this is machine generated code that now falls into your hands and now you are the ones responsible for this code because it gets outdated immediately, it gets generated. I know it's easy with your IDE to generate a new property or rename a property. Uh, how do you migrate a type of a property? or even better, delete the property. All these things now you have to do by hand. So if we as developers are aware of the, the, the Java Beans convention, would it be great if the compiler be aware of the convention and just use it as it is? Something like a macro feature in Java? That would be great to have. Sadly, we don't have such feature, but we have something that looks very close to that. And I'm talking about Lombok. Lombok is a feature that paralyzes the community. Either you love it, like Roberto and myself, or you might hate it. There's no middle ground, just like Sebastian. Okay, so what Lombok does is generate bytecode on the fly. It can generate new bytecode separated from the current class, or it can generate new bytecode on the same class. And this is the reason why some people consider it very harmful. It is safe. We use this thing with our customers and Canoe, and our customers are Swiss banks. And yes, despite what you see in the news, they're actually safe to use. So what this, uh, this POJO, this is the repository POJO that we're going to use to map the JSON payload into Java. So we're using two projects here, Lombok and Jackson. Jackson, we're going to use some annotations in order to uh, do the mapping within the camel case and the nest snake case. And notice that we also have this annotation here at the top on the class. It says, ignore unknown properties. What is going on? Remember that I said that the payload may have like 40 different properties, but we only care about four, only those four. So if more properties come in and this POJO does not have a mapping for that, not a problem. But if you set this to false or just take it out, and I have more properties than I the ones that I have mapped, or the types do not match, a problem will appear. Sometimes you want this to happen, sometimes you don't. Now the add data annotation from Lombok will generate getters and setters for each property, a constructor, um, equals and hash code, and two string implementation. And this is the whole class. If you generate the inspected bytecode, it will contain everything that you expect, getter, setters, constructor, everything. Now, I know that these two things look a little bit crazy because we are annotating with add setter, another annotation from Lombok, because we want to add more definitions to generated methods. What this thing is telling is that when it generates the setter method for the HTML URL property that follows the camel case convention, it will be as it had also this annotation attached to it, and that's how Jackson will do the correct mapping within camel case and snake case. Uh, who here is familiar with the builder pattern? Sometimes we want to have immutable classes, right? But we need a mutable option to create these immutable instances. The builder pattern is a nice way to have this. But by the very nature of the conventions of the builder pattern, it is very verbose. Let me show you an alternative. Use a static method with any name. I chose build. Pass the any parameters that you want to. Here, this type, you will, you, this type will be the immutable instance. And then just set all the values and return the object, and you're done. 
you can change the name of the method. You, you can add different constraints to the builder annotation. Now, my suggestion is to use add data, setter, getter, and builder. There are other annotations coming from Lombok that may or may not be harmful, but if you stay only with the Pojo annotations and builder, you should be fine. Here's another example using um, a simple hierarchy. So there is one type application event, which is quite simple. It's empty, as a matter of fact. And then we have a subclass where we can tweak the generated equals and hash code and to a string to include whatever information is coming from the superclass. So if I add a new property here, the equals and hash code implementation of the children will have the new type as well. Now that, that's this interesting uh, Pojo has an annotation called uh, non-null coming from JSR 305 and also has that type of uh, that property uh, set as final. This means it will generate a constructor that takes one instance. Uh, there we go. It, the, the, it will generate a constructor that takes a single instance and it will do a validation. If you pass a null, it will tell you, it will pop up a null pointer exception, but instead of just saying null pointer exception as is, it will tell you I expected a value for the instance field and you didn't give me any. So it's a little bit better than that. So Lombok, oh, PowerPoint is dead, so I'm going to bring it back just like that. There we go. Lombok reduces boilerplate code. It relies on the APT processing tool, so you must have annotation processing enabled. Uh, if, is anybody here using NetBeans besides Kirk? Because annotation processing is enabled in NetBeans by default, so you don't have to do anything. Processors get grabbed from the class path immediately. If you're using IntelliJ, you just have to check one tick on the project properties, and that's it. And if you're using Eclipse, I'm so sorry. Besides checking one tick on the preferences, you have to manually find all the processors in the class path. So if you're using Gradle, the Gradle uh, processor or all the artifacts will be found on a cache based on a hash. So if you change the version number, that means that you're going to find a different hash. You will have to change these things again manually. How are we doing? Good so far? OK. So uh, in terms of behavior, actually what I want to figure out is a little bit about monitoring. And I know that Kurt will be crazy here because what we actually want to do is journaling. Uh, there is no good logging framework in Java. There are so many out there and all of that are bad. But at least SLF4J is the least worst of them. Yes, I know there's another option that is not actually a journal and it's not logging, it's journaling, but so there are two reasons why SLF4J is not that bad. One is that it's capable of funneling all the different login frameworks into a single API. So if you're consuming a dependency that depends on transitively into commas login or Java UT login or some other login framework, it doesn't matter. SLF4J will allow everything to go into one place. And the next one is when you are creating login statements, when you log in something, if it's a simple string, fine. But if it's not, if you're concatenating values and creating the message is expensive, you'll get in trouble if the login level that you're trying to invoke is not enabled. Because what is going to happen is that you create the whole thing, the method is invoked, and because it's not enabled, it gets it discarded immediately. So you're just wasting cycles. What do we do as developers? we start to add if guards around our login statement. So now our code looks uglier than before. If you use the variable arguments version of the login statements, then the if guard is put inside the method. So now there's no problem. Uh, you could alternatively, instead of using SLF4J, use log4j2, or as Kirk says, use proper journaling and use Crucible, which is not a login framework. Uh, Chronicle. Crucible is something else. But that's the wrong thing to do. Yes. Okay. So now let's get into HTTP. Now, I would expect most of you to be familiar with the Apache HTTP client, isn't it? Yeah, not so good client. 
And uh, there is actually a much better way to do things. And it's called OK HTTP from Square. Now, Square is a company that writes software for Android. And uh, that means that the libraries are very small in memory size, in memory footprint, and they don't have many dependencies. As a matter of fact, I discovered this very uh, just a couple of weeks ago. OK, HTTP has no dependency on a login framework whatsoever. There's no way that you can tell what it's doing unless you use debugging. Anyway, it's easy to use OK HTTP. Just create a client, set up a request, uses the builder pattern, so you can set uh, the URL, headers, anything that is needed, send it through the client, and you get a response object. On the response, you can inspect the status, the message, the body, the headers. It's just easy as that. And what is great about OKHttp is that it's a good complement to Jetty because OKHttp is HTTP2 ready. And Jetty is the sole server right now on, on Java that also does HTTP2. I know that Java 9 has an incubating module for HTTP2, but it's incubating for a reason, whereas the Jetty is officially released and stable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, basically. So the reason to use OKHttp2 is simpler, smaller memory footprint. It's fully proof because it, it relies or it can use already HTTP2, and it's highly configurable with different factors. And we're going to see that in just a moment. Because it's one thing to say we're going to consume HTTP, but we are Java developers. It would be better if we just simply get Java objects directly from a network or Wouldn't it be great? Well, yeah. And then how many times do, how many ways are there to implement a REST API or the REST behavior on top of HTTP? There's only one. There's only one way to do things. Uh, so may, the, what I would suggest is to use this project called Retrofit, also from the Square company. Now, what Retrofit allows you to do is to define the contract of your API using Java types. So you define an interface like this, and those annotations, add get and add path, are from Retrofit. Basically, what you want to do is define, for example, there's a repository call that takes a parameter that's the organization name and returns a list of repository. Notice the Java types. Those are your types. If this resource is paginated, the repositories API, if you look at it, it will tell you how to return, how to import uh, how to find if there is a next page, and there is a next page you're going to get an URL, and that is why we have this other tag here, this other uh, method, to follow the pages. Okay, so once you do this, the next thing to do is create the actual retrofit client. Uh, you pass some parameters, you configure the Jackson factory, so this thing will know how to convert JSON to Java. Then once you do that, you finally apply the uh, interface that we designed before. So what is happening under the covers, Retrofit builds a Java Lang Reflect proxy that delegates all calls to an OK HTTP client that matches the API that you define. So once you do this, just creating the pro or accessing the API is just a matter of using a regular Java object. You pass in a Java type, and what you get as a response, as a reply, is Java types as well. Sorry, it's turtles all the way down? Yeah, kind of, but it's OK HTTP. So uh, it's extensible via factories. It's just simple REST. That's it. Now, remember about multi-thread code and in the UI, there's one single rule. Everything that is UI goes in one thread. Anything that is isn't goes in any other thread. Doesn't matter which one, as long as it's not the UI. Uh, so for this, we need to be sure that we can invoke code in background thread, but because it's a new UI application, it's UI based, we need to update the UI back again. Remember the application that we were updating the list as we were processing pages? So even though we were reading information on the background, we needed to push data into the list. How can we do this? Is there any mechanism that you know that will allow you to run a background thread and then notify into another? Well, in the web space, they came up with something called promises, that you run a background task, and when this thing is done, it will let you know through a series of callbacks. Well, in Java, we have promises. 
In Java 8, we have something called completable future. It's not a promise. It's supposed to be, but it's not. It's both blocking because it's a future, and it's non blocking because it's a completing stage. It is a weird animal. It's actually a chimera. But JDefer is a real promise. So with JDefer, you can do this thing. You define the type promise, and it takes three generic arguments. The first one is the return value of the background task. The second one is the error that it might be thrown. And you can throw any type, a string if you want to, or a domain object that makes sense for you. And the final one is that if the background task would like to publish intermediate results, then that will be it. This definition says I don't have any intermediate results, but if you look into the code in the repository, you will see there are other versions of the same application that have immediate, immediate, uh, intermediate results. So there are two things that we need to do. One, set up the promise or set up the background task, and the second one is consume it. This one is setting up the background task. We have another object called defer manager coming from JDefer, and we can use lambdas. Why not? Lambda expression. This lambda expression is the background task because that object, that API, this is the retrofit client. Notice that it's so easy. What is the HTTP complexity? The only thing that we need to figure out is that based on the response, if it's successful, we return the body. This is the list of repositories automatically parsed from Jackson. There's nothing else that we need to do. And if it's not successful, we simply say, pop up an error, and uh, let's see what happens, how the consumer will deal with this one. So far, so good? OK. So let's see the consumer. The consumer looks like this. This is the code of the controller again. Um, we invoke the, op the promise, so we get the promise back. And then we have the option to configure our callbacks. This version, you notice that it's also re this returning a value here on the third type. So this is the one that will push intermediate results. For the progress callback, this is how we handle intermediate results. What we're going to do is method reference to add that element to a list. If there is an error, then we just print it. We'll see a way to figure uh, to do that, handle it properly later. And regardless of if there is an error or if the promise was successful, we want to do something else. Remember when I was clicking on the button that it became disabled when the, it was running and then suddenly the application finished, it became enabled again? This is it. We're, push, we're just changing the state, and the button will react to it using JavaFX bindings. So what I like about JDefer is that it gives you that capability, promises for Java. It's Java 8 friendly, and it's a one-shot execution. So this one background task, and once you're done, you're done. You can chain uh, callbacks if you want to, but if you want to have or you want to process more values uh, as time passes by, you will need to handle something like a stream of values or a stream of events. And that's where we get into reactive programming, the latest buzzword. Basically, reactive programming is nothing more than property chain listener, a property chain event on the server side. If you hire desktop developers, then going into reactive programming should be just a no-brainer. There are some projects out there that give you reactive programming in Java, but probably the most well-known is RxJava. What we're going to do is instead of using a promise, we use an observable if it's RxJava 1, or if it's RxJava 2, you use something called a flowable. What's the difference? Flowable gives you the capabilities of back pressure, whereas observable in RxJava kind of did it, but didn't actually. So you will see that the, uh, from the promise, the code doesn't look so different, except that now, we can add a timeout. If the network operation takes more than 10 seconds, then we just want to bail out. When we subscribe, we change the state. And when we finish, regardless if it was an error or success, we also change the state so the button reacts accordingly. We subscribe on a background scheduler so that we don't block the current thread. And when we subscribe, as events come, keep uh, streaming into, we will push those into a, a, a list, or if there's an error, we simply print it out to the stack trace. Or you can just send it to somewhere else to deal with that error. Now you may be wondering, this is great. We can use observables, but can we mix Arcs, Java, and Retrofit together? Right? Because we're dealing with Java code. Well, guess what? You can. You have to do two things. Change your contract first. 
because now instead of returning a call object as we did before, we're going to return an observable or response list repository. Why is this? Because we are paginating results. So for every page, we got a response. And eventually, what we want to do is somehow transform observable response of list repository into just observable repository. There is a magic way to do that. The next thing we do is make sure that the retrofit client is aware of Iris Java, so we only add one more factory to the builder, and that's it. Now, we can use Iris Java with retrofit. And remember what I was saying, that to, in order to uh, shorten observable response list repository into just observable repository, well, the advantage of Rx Java is that we can have many operations on top of observables, for example, concatenate and flat map and other stuff. So what I have in the code is uh, the way that you can deal with the first page or a strategy to deal with the uh, other pages. The links object is just a simple pojo that knows how to parse the headers and find the next link if it, ex if it exists. So basically what we want to do is something like this. We pass the observable, the first page, and then we flat map everything. We find the next header, and if it's something there, here is actually the current items from the, 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 the current page. And if we have more links, then we should follow recursively the same method, concatenating everything. So that's how we turn a response that has an observable response list repository in just observable repository, just by applying the operations available on observable. There are other options. You could use Project Reactor from Spring. The, uh, the API from Project Reactor and Iris Java are very much close alike. So if you use one and then decide to switch to the other, there's just a tiny changes that you need to do, and off you go. Finally, let's look into component. Yes, question. Yes. Oh, this, this. Oh, yeah, yeah. This, this is because this is the code of the controller, and the controller has a reference to an object called model because an MVC. So what I'm doing here in the subscription, I'm saving the subscription on a model object because if you remember the application, it has a cancel button. So when you click cancel, it will cancel the subscription and remove that object. So it's, this is just to remember that I can console this at any time. But it's not related to RxJava itself. Uh, finally, component communication. Even though we're using dependency injection, it's easy for an object or a component to have a reference to its collaborators. But somehow, you want a component to uh, send a message to anybody else without knowing who else may be listening. For this, uh, we will use a lightweight event bus. Guava has an event bus, but it's uh, not so good. I would recommend to use something called Ambassador. And the, what we want to do is inject an application event bus. And instead of printing to the stack trace the throwable that we got, we publish an event. Do you remember the throwable event that we saw earlier with Lombok? Well, here it is. And uh, we have two ways of publication. We can publish and let the, con the producer wait for all consumers. That's a synchronous publishing. Or we can do like this one, which is asynchronous. The publisher says, here's an event, and then fire and forget. And then the consumers will do the thing with the event, and the publisher can continue to do its work, whatever it needs to do. Now, Ambassador, uh, I have a simple event handler in the code, and uh, I like to have my code to be neat and tidy. So this code, this particular component, will register itself with the event bus using pass construct when the dependency injection container says, now I want to use this instance. And when the container says, I no longer need the instance, then just unsubscribe using pre-destroy. Neat, a, a really nice uh, life cycle. The important thing is here, how do we handle the event? We annotate any method name that you want with any visibility, with at handler, and second is the type of event. This is how we can match. And now inside that, 
you will put any code. If you look into the, con the, the code that is in the repository, it actually creates an alert. And I can uh, show you how this thing runs. Uh, something, for example, if I were to disable the network, uh, say network off, Griffon uh, legacy, and then click load. Well, where is the, er the error is in the background, but it didn't appear here. Oh, nice. Should have appeared as a dialog. Well, if it's not broken, it's not live demo. There we go. The advantages for using the Venbus ambassador is because it's very lightweight. There is a benchmark comparing it to Google Guava. But even though we use it in production and we haven't found any problems, if you find a problem, the author is not so, long, not so much active as it was in the past. That's the only cave that I need to tell you. Now we can get into testing. And I believe I have like five minutes. What? Ah, no, Bertha is not. Ten minutes? 10 minutes to go into testing. So that's pretty much production. How about that? Now let's get into testing. And I will assume that most of you are familiar with JUnit 4. Is anybody here already using JUnit 5? Experimenting. OK. Anybody here had the need to parameterize a test with JUnit 4? Just a few hands. Well, let me tell you that it's not so fun. When you parameterize a test case, uh, you can parameterize a single method because you parameterize the, the order and the types. And you want to have a different method with, uh, with another method with different types in different order, then you have to have a different test case. That's bad. Well, if you use JUnit params, you can parameterize as many test methods as you want in the same test case. You can supply the test data on the method as is. You can supply the name of a method that is the data provider, or you can supply the class name that is the data provider. Notice that you have to use a custom runner. So if you are already using a different runner for a particular test case, you cannot use JUnit params to parameterize said test case. JUnit has its own version for a parameterization, so you will not need JUnit params for that. They have an extension mechanism. It's not runners. Uh, I, I haven't delved into that fact if, if you can do it. I know they had a ticket open for that a few weeks ago, uh, but I haven't checked back if it's already fixed. OK, so JUnit Params pretty much gives you uh, the capabilities to uh, do parameterization much better if you're still using JUnit 4. Now, because we're dealing with dependency injection, uh, we want to test our classes in, in isolation from our collaborators or other real production code. So what is that what we usually do? Mocking. There are a few libraries out there, but probably the best one is Mokito, especially Mokito 2. Latest release is 2.9.0, I believe. If it, well, they make a release every single week. They find a bug or add a new feature, they post a release. There is, this thing is so fast. Well, let's see. You see that I'm using um, parameterization with JUnit params. And uh, this, here's the controller. And I'm going to mock a service object. So this is a static method from Mokito. So that's my mock. And then the when method is another static method from Mokito that will use the real method with a real value. When that expectation occurs, then we're going to return some value. Execute the stimuli here. Do the verification on the object that we expect, the controller, but also do the ver verification on the mock. The verify method is another static method from Mokito. So it's, Mokito is pretty much a static DSL for defining expectations. You can define expectations on three types of objects. A stops, like we saw earlier. This is simply a can response. A mock, which are stricter. You must invoke uh, the mock in the same order of the expectations and with the same cardinality. If you invoke it in a different order or with less or more invocations, something is wrong. And finally, spies. Spies are real objects real production code 
for which you only want to mock out or stop out a few pieces. So this is this, the, great, uh, the way for you to test out exceptional cases when you want to throw an exception, but it's kind of weird to do it in real production code. We just fake out this and just throw the exception. If you're using JUnit and Juice and Mokito, well, there's a project that combines all of them together. It's called Yukito. Yeah, sounds like uh, martial arts. And uh, Yukito has a custom runner. You can do injections on the test case. This type, the sample service, because we didn't define a binding from it, it's going to be a mock. And what is great about this is that if you have more than one class that requires the same collaborator, sample service, they're going to have the same mock instance because it's everything coming together thanks to the dependency injection container. So once you do that, just apply the same code that we saw before, and there is the verify and the assert that. Yukito has a way for you to have multiple values for the same um, type. So it's in a way how you can parameterize a test case. But this only makes sense if you're using juice as dependency injection. Anybody here uses uh, Groovy? No? Anybody here uh, heard of a Spark testing framework? Well, all that we saw before can be done with a single project, and that project is called a Spark. Spark gives you parameterization. What is that? That's a very strange method name. Why? Because that method name is a string. And we use this notation to, do, to define the placeholders for the values for each uh, in invocation of our methods. Here is the sample control as we saw before. Uh, Spock has its own form syntax for defining mocks, but this is exactly the same as we saw earlier. The blocks are important given when, then, where. Here's where we set up the collaborators or mocks. When is when we execute the stimuli. Then is when we do the assertions, and because of that, you don't see explicit assertion, but the uh, uh, Spock will do the right thing for us. And output is a string. Controller.model.output, that's actually resolved to controller, get model, get output. Those things are a string. What is that? A comparison of strings. Is that how we compare strings in Java? No, right? But we wish we could, right? So Groovy, Groovy gives you that capability because Groovy has operator overloading. And this operator resolves to the call to the equals method. So it's doing the right thing for you. Short yeah, well. <laughs> and finally, the where method is where we define the parameterization. It looks weird, but that's the less shift operator with a list. That's actually native syntax for a list where you had two strings. And here we have two other strings. So those are be the values. And because you have the on-roll annotation at the top, this method turns out to be actually two different methods because those values will be used here. When you see in your IDE or your HTML report, you will see two different methods instead of just one. So basically, a Spark is a testing DSL on asteroids. It actually has more features, like uh, sub-assertions and the next one, which is waiting. Because we are writing the concurrent code, sometimes we need to wait for some background task to finish and continue. And the easiest way to do this is thread.slip, isn't it? And when we do this, we might be waiting for too long because sometimes we say, oh, 2,000 uh, milliseconds or 5,000 milliseconds. Well, it turns out that your test will always wait for that period of time. It would be better if we have a conditional way to uh, to wait. Uh, so wait utility is another static DSL that gives us that capability. This code, because it's running our either with observables or with a promise, we know it's going to be run on a background thread. So this point of time in our test, we're going to wait for this thing. This is just a method reference, so this is a callable. Using a hand quest matcher, this is the condition. And we're going to wait at most two seconds. If this condition is fulfilled before two seconds, the test continues. If this condition is not matched within two seconds, the test fails. And now, after that, 
same thing as we saw before. Finally, remember that we're testing a GitHub, uh, against the GitHub API. So uh, we need to test our client against a server. It would be bad if we test against the real GitHub API, isn't it? Because there are rate limits and account settings and whatnot. Um, what, what would be the option? Set up our own fake GitHub server? And at what time do we run it? Outside the tests? So how do we make sure that we're setting the right state for the particular test? Not so good, isn't it? Would it be better if we were able to run the server as part of the build? Yeah, maybe. But we will be setting a server for all of our test cases. We'll have to share a state, another problem. It would be better if we can embed the fake server into the test case itself. And that's what Wiremark allows you to do. Use a JUnit rule and uh, you define a fake server on a particular port and then define some expectations. If a request comes in that matches this definition, then we're going to reply with some JSON response. If there is another request that matches that URL, then we're going to reply with some other response. And here, let me show you the application live. Let's disconnect the, uh, the network. And now I'm going to do a clean and a test. No hands. This will run the unit test, integration test, and a functional test. And the functional test using a project called TestFX that runs the UI and hits a fake server. And there's the error dialog that I was looking for before. And that all the tests pass. The test should be green. Uh, yep. And there we go. That's basically it. So I'm pretty much on time, I believe. Remember that everything that we saw is open source. The easiest, fastest way for you to contribute to open source is if you find a problem, please file a ticket. If you have the time and the inclination and the skills and you really have the passion, supply a test case and supply a patch if you want to. But if anything else, please file an issue. If you want to know more about the stuff that we saw today, I have an online uh, newsletter in English and in Spanish. Uh, so subscribers welcome. And for that, I think that's pretty much on time. If you have any questions, I would be very happy to take them. Otherwise, well, it will be the turn for Sebastian. No? All right, perfect. Thank you very much.